you talk about workplace improvement, you're talking about your union uh, representation. So the question is, if as the head of a PSU, you're looking at workplace improvement and the union snowballs it, which incarnation of yours is from it? Ma'am, union, the unionist of union in India has been pronounced for past couple of years, mm -hmm. for past couple of decades, to be honest. Uh, under this scenario, I would actually take a role of a transactional leader. As a transactional leader, there will be two aspects to my activity. Mm -hmm. so the first aspect would be looking at legitimate demands of the union. Like, it's not always that the unions are on the wrong page. Okay. First of all, I'd be probably, I'll be setting up an inquiry and involved with our inquiry team, which would actually also include the members of the administration, members of the union, members of the staff, and we'll be conducting an inquiry about the feasibility of demands. We'll be working on it, we'll be thinking about how much of it can be implemented or can be, how much of, of about its feasibility, to be a feasibility study. Now on the other hand, any action which is detrimental to the interests of the company or against the rules of the company, or against company discipline in general, would be dealt with very strongly. So this is my post action. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when you studied international relations, did you, did you do a theoretical international relations? So Realism, idealism, constructivism. To fair extent, I did a theoretical study, but it was based mostly confined to the levels of the examination. Sir. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll ask a different question. Um, we haven't. India has not signed a free trade agreement with the country now for over ten years. Suddenly, we have signed in quick succession a one with the United Arab Emirates, one with Australia, uh, one with Mauritius, and we are about to sign an early harvest with, with Great Britain, and we are planning with Taiwan. Israel uh, and a couple of others next in the European Union next year. Why do you think the government has had this huge shift in trade policy? So I'm not being entirely sure, but if allowed to make a guess, I could make it. So I believe that the change in the government policy is stemming from the realism that we are actually experiencing in international politics. Uh, we see the countries, uh, given the fact that the COVID, the COVID pandemic and uh, the current Russia-Ukraine crisis has uh, disrupted supply chains globally. And we feel that India on its way of passing the report up needs to have significant exchanges, especially in the field of trade with other nations as well. So I think the time is opportune now as the world looks at India as an important player of global, global politics, global geopolitics, to take shape. And trade today stands as a major role, as a major element of international connectivity, of international uh, diplomacy and this is why I feel that the recent focus on trade is an important part of India consolidating its international relations. Um, well, uh, another question which is uh, on Pakistan. Now, 10, even 15 years ago, Pakistan was an overriding obsession with us in foreign policy. Literally everything revolved around Pakistan. Today, you can literally go for months without the foreign ministry mentioning the word Pakistan ever. I mean, no other reference to it at all. Why do you think that's changed? Sir, I believe there are two major causes that have led to the change of the global scenario with respect to India and Pakistan. One is about India. About India, our, our diplomatic profile, our, our role in the international arena has increased by leaps and bounds. Today we are not the same India that we see that the world has viewed us, let's say, 10 years ago. Today we are seen as a country that is the hope of the food, hope for the future. Today we are seen as a country as a major geopolitical player in the global geopolitical arena. So India actually cho has chosen to diversify its areas rather than focusing on a very narrow and restrictive on our west, on our west neighbor. And for Pakistan, there is a reason why uh, the, the India-Pakistan narrative has lower, uh, like, simmered down a bit. It is about Pakistan as well. Pakistan was very much backed by United States for a very long period of time. So it had a significant global clock. However, within the coming, in the couple of years, it followed by the internal crisis in Pakistan and the loss of American support, America moving towards India, leaning a bit towards India. We see that Pakistan is losing this edge in the international arena. So the, this voice that Pakistan had in the international affairs is simmering down a bit and this has actually led to a transformation of India India's interest from Pakistan to other places like the Middle East, the Far East, and Europe, Latin, Latin America. So. 
But Pakistan is now backed by China, which is many ways the other superpower. So why would necessarily the loss of the U.S. and the replacement of that with China, why would that necessarily be a matter of great loss to Pakistan? China, in fact, is right next to us. It's much more able to put pressure on us. Sir, Pakistan does enjoy a very strong support of China. However, at the same time, the geopolitical clout that U.S. had, the U.S. hegemony, the U.S. influence of, on global affairs is not the same as Chinese, the Chinese influence. I agree with you, I absolutely agree with you, sir, that China has been the savior of Pakistan and India from many times. But at the same time, it does not actually provide that level of insurance that China, that America provides in their international sphere. So this is probably one of the reasons. I am not aware about any other reason, but I'll make sure to read about it. Um, okay, one last question. Now, India used to be a great proponent of the alignment. Uh, but you may have noticed Prime Minister Modi has not attended a single non-aligned summit since he has become Prime Minister. We now use the phrase strategic autonomy to describe the broad basis of our foreign policy. What in your sense is the difference between non-alignment and strategic autonomy? So non-alignment has been a part of our India's foreign policy for a very long period of time. However, with the Newer, newfound power that you know, influence that India has in the global, uh, global arena, we have moved from a non-alignment to an issue-based alignment, where actually we are putting our points, or putting our views on basis of what our stand is, what na national interest is, and not necessarily what the time demands of us. So I think this is the major reason why this shift has been visible. So, so whether the argument that you're making is that non-alignment is not necessarily interest-based. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, I do not actually intend to say that. I say I believe that non-alignment has been in focus of India's interest. However, we are diversifying it. We are not just taking it with a position of non-alignment. We are actually aligning, but on the issues that concern our interests more. Thank you. Do you like watching football? What was this hand of God go? The uh, hand of God goal is a controversial yet one of the most famous goals scored in the football history. It was in 1986 World Cup semi final by Diego Maradona against 1986 World Cup semi final by Diego Maradona against uh, England. Wherein he actually jumped and he actually used an Harry's hand to guide the ball, which was actually over, going over his head. So, this is the famous, infamous goal. There was another goal, it's called the goal of century. You know about that? So, if I may be allowed to guess, was it in the same match, the second goal that Maradona scored against him and when he dribbled for a past eight players and the goalkeeper? And uh, yeah, your guess is very It's in the same match for the next goal. Yes, yeah. Anyway, apart from football, let me take up the migrants' problem. Okay. Covid had a huge problem of labor migration. And a lot of labor, the migrant force, they suffer because of the restrictions put by different state governments. It's not work. They were stuck. They have to be fed. What do you think central government has been doing since COVID problem on this issue? So since the migrant crisis, which, which was involved in the COVID crisis of 2020, uh, central government has taken a couple of steps regarding the economy. One of them is the provision of One Nation, One Right Ration Card, which provides ration to migrant neighbors irrespective of their place of ration card. The other would be creating durable assets in the rural sector, especially like uh, the transfer, like the transcendency of the Madrega works to create in creating greater capital assets for utilization. And the third is the increase in the Madrega wage bill, which, sorry, in the Madrega daily salaries, which was probably from 182 to 102 per day. And apart from that, there have been certain other initiatives like increased expenditure on the and increased agri investments. Like farm laws was also pro proposed as a solution that would have actually helped the rural agriculture, especially the farmer, especially the migrants who have taken up farming. But then was it was So these are a couple of steps that I can think of. Did the farm law bill have any uh, aspect of migrant labor in that? Are you sure about that? Uh, no sir, farm law directly did not address the migrant papers. However, the couple of uh, poli policies or the points that were put forward in the farm, law, farm bills were actually 
aim at improving the rural agricultural sector and this would have had an impact on those migrants who actually like have decided to like get it get back to agriculture sir. But I think mainly it was for the farmers, yes. not for the migrant labor no, that mainly. this law was framed. Yes, it was mainly for the farmers. You know, quite often the opposition leaders uh, complain about uh, the country's uh, aims, so uh, like unemployment is going up, poverty is going up, inequality is going up. Can they work together or if unemployment goes up, does it necessarily mean that poverty is also going up? First answer the second question, the specific one. So, can I get some seconds to think about it? Okay. So, conventionally, if you look at things, if you look at both the player for the perspective of and from perspective of economics, usually growth and employ uh, unemployment they go against each other. Like when a growth increases, the growth rate of an economy increases, there is a, we see a marked reduction in the unemployment. However, there have been periods wherein we have witnessed jobless growth, wherein the growth rate has increased, but at the same time, the not enough jobs has been created. So this is a phenomena which has been observed, and India has been a victim to this. However, sir, in, a, in the past couple of quarters, we take, see things getting to a better scale. We see the, the data released by CMI has shown that the unemployment levels have actually started falling out, falling after the peak that has been hit during the COVID months. And at the same time, we, the RBI and the other organizations have forecasted a positive growth rate. So we look at an optimistic picture for the economy in the coming. Are they related to poverty? So poverty. generally, if you look so at... My question was a little bit analytical. Right? Yeah. When unemployment goes up, does it necessarily mean that poverty also goes up? So, with my very limited knowledge on the topic, sir, I would actually probably make a guess on these things that with an increase in general level of unemployment, we find that uh, the number of hands that are working in an economy and the number of mouths to feed remains same, but the number of hands that are working in an economy decreases due to which the entire family setup suffers. And at the same time, sir, we see that. Often, are you familiar with how we actually come to a number of poverty? Uh, poverty rate? Uh, uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. The planning commission are we are used to do it, and now we have. Uh, I was, I had read about it. I remember multi, reading about multi, it. Multi-dimensional poverty. Have you come across? Yes, sir. Multi-dimensional poverty. What is it, sir? Sir. It goes against the conventional de uh, definition of poverty, but and includes other dimensions which include the, like say, let's say education, health, healthcare, and education and the nutrition. So it does not just encompass the conventional definition definition of income. It expands the definition of poverty to include other dimensions which are essential for sustenance so, or for good standard of living. So. In a federal country like India, we have different states states development trajectories are very different, right? And uh, some of them are influenced by the federal policy, the central policies, but some of them are very much state specific policies. Uh, just think about Kerala and the state. Now, what are the crucial state level policies which might have this difference between Kerala and take any other? What is special about Kerala? So, Kerala is one of the few states where land reforms in post-independent India has been achieved with a, have been brought on with a very high rate of success. So when we say that Kerala has achieved certain development, certain kind of development, in terms of certain indicators, yes. what are the certain indicators? So, Kerala performs very well on socio-economic indicators and it isn't the state with the highest gross state GDP, but it is one of the states that performs exceptionally well in case of uh, indicators like salt schooling, healthcare, deliveries. It has very low more, uh, MMR, maternal mortality rate, IMR, infant mortality rate, incidences of hunger. Then the unemployment scenario in Kerala is also standard. So the first thing that came to your mind was land reforms. I mean, does it have direct 
connection with these technologies. Bangladesh also has done that, but without that. So I believe that for the last 20 years, Bangladesh's IMR is falling. But Bangladesh has not gone through that kind of thing. So what is your take? So about a state like Kerala, which has high number of rural population, so land reforms becomes crucial for creating of an egalitarian and non feudal society, sir. And for my very limited knowledge of Bangladesh, uh, the success of Bangladesh can be owed for, for to the self-help groups and the focus on its own limited term strengths like uh, textile exports, export-driven growth, sir. So this is what my limited knowledge on this, but I'll definitely be reading. Thank you. Recently, the National Green Tribunal has ruled that the government of India should basically put in a committee to do research on what are microplastics. So, have you heard about microplastics, what are microplastics, and why is it such a burning issue that the National Green Tribunal had to take it up recently? Yes, sir. Uh, so, microplastics are plastic uh, bodies which have dimensions in the range of micro, in the, in the micro ranges, sir. So, they are regarded as a major environmental menace because we have we frequently come across news like microplastics being found in fish in the oceans and very recently a report came out wherein microplastics were detected in human blood. So this is a major carcinogen as well as major human blood. And what diameter will you qualify a plastic as micro and non-micro? So what is that range which you are looking at? I would say 10 to the power minus 6 meters to 10 to the power minus 4 meters would be microplastics and for that would be mini plastics and other things, higher things. Recent budget and the economic survey basically talks about our honorable finance minister saying that we have recovered from, recovered from COVID because of our barbell strategy which uh, they have been speaking about in the last economic survey and this survey as well. The agile framework is the Indian economy is following or a barbell strategy which they are following. Have you heard about this? Before? I'm sorry sir. It is, it is say for example I will let you know what is a barbell strategy which is basically finding a worst case scenario and then making incremental changes to this worst case scenario so that you can adjust government policy to that particular response. Now it is, as per the Honorable Finance Minister, it is different from the waterfall method of planning and then coming up with a solution and then affecting a problem. Rather jump into the problem, find the worst case scenario and start implementing change. Now me telling you this, can you find out where government actually implemented the strategy in recent months in a public policy decision or in a response? So, I do not have an exact idea of it. Say you are the DM of a district and there is a large amount of stubble burning which happens in your uh, district. Meaning the farmers burning crops, uh, the remains of crops after the season and then setting the field next up for the next season. So, the stubble burning is going on. How will you counter stubble burning? So, I would uh, divide my strategy into two steps. One would be short term and another would be long term. Job. In the short term steps, sir, since double burning is not permitted under law, I would actually ask the officials and the administration to ensure that double burning is what was immediate for At the same time, I would actually be looking for solutions within this uh, technical framework and not technical framework. Like we have heard about this chemical being developed by Tusa, the Tusa decomposer decomposes double into the fields. So if that is available in the in stock, I would actually put in a requisition and would ensure that the farmers get access to it at nominal or at very marginal cost. In the long term, I would actually be coordinating with the farmers, creating awareness of it. Then we can have we heard about this happy seeder machines which actually help in uh, uprooting stubble. So this could this can be done. And then at the same time, proper monitoring of you know, and then in the seasons wherein we find the incidences of stubble burning. I'll actually make sure that the administration is extra, extra vigilant. If the need be to add administration, will, administration will be responsive towards the problems. You have a very interesting hobby called blogging. Now, I read about blogging and it says that it is basically jogging, basically picking up because Swedish, up Swedish word, yeah. blog up. <coughs> now, I also tried to convince my friend that it is a very good hobby and we should take up blogging. So he says if we start doing blogging in India, 
I will not be able to jog at all because the entire place is so, uh, so dirty. So my, how will I convince my friend to take up blogging? How did you convince yourself? Because in India, it's impossible to jog if you are blogging. Because if I start on a street, it is clogged with garbage. I will just keep playing garbage and will not be able to move it. So what, how did you convince yourself? So I started this activity in, that, in the remote town of Pilani. So this act, Pilani as such isn't that polluted. So, but then there was plastic waste in, in any part of the country is amazing. So I started with it, uh, the activity with a couple of friends. I told myself, I, I told myself that uh, quote that Neil Armstrong had said, "One step, small step for a man's a giant leap for mankind." So this was with, this is what I started with, and it was like incremental change. I did not have to clean the entire city the first go. Probably one street at a time. On, like it might be on a cooperative basis like for the one person holds the bag and then we can actually photograph our change and then we can actually it's about the small incremental changes that lead up to a big change so this is what I would say Blogging comes from Sweden which other uh, environmental activist has been in new, news from Sweden other than the person who started blogging Mr. Eric which other uh, major environmentalist or environmental voice came out of Sweden So okay, thank you very interesting Thank you. Uh, so, okay, Mr. Shukla, uh, thank you very much. Please wait outside for a short while. We'll call you back to give you the feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much.